So good morning everyone and I know that you've heard about marine spatial planning before this week. Uh, still we are going uh, for some more in-depth information, I hope. So there are a lot of definitions and terminology for marine spatial planning. The most common ones are marine or maritime spatial planning, commonly known as MSP, but you can also find reference to ocean planning, marine planning, ocean zoning, marine spatial management, sea use management. So all these, inf all these definitions uh, end up uh, referring to a process of organizing and managing the distribution of ocean uses in space and time in order to reduce conflicts between uses and between uses and the environment. And indeed, in one of the most common definitions from the, the UNESCO guidelines, the three pillars of sustainability are mentioned. The, it's, it's, it is stated that uh, MSP is intended to achieve objectives from the ecological dimension, eco economic dimension, and social dimension. And so, marine spatial planning has been recognized as a tool or an approach with high potential to ensure sustainability in oceans use. <coughs> Indeed, MSP has started in the 1980s. Um, many people refer to the original zoning plan of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in Australia, Australia as a pioneer example of marine special planning. Um, but also, the idea of marine functional zoning in China arised in 1988, so these two can be seen as two pioneer examples uh, that started almost 40 years ago with MSP. For the last 30, 40 years, MSP has spread around the world and it's currently under development or already approved and implemented in about 70 countries. And this is what the development, the spread of MSP looked like in the beginning of this year. Um, as you can see, um, not all the processes are in the same stage of development. The majority, about 70% of them, are still in early stages, not yet approved. But 22 countries already have MSP in place. And these are some of them. And so, as MSP processes started being developed around the world, information of in, on MSP also started uh, being published and becoming available. And so, also in the beginning of 2018, this is what the evolution of uh, MSP literature uh, looked like. And at this point in 2009, uh, the UNESCO published the step-by-step guide to marine special planning. So this is a 10-step guide to understanding what marine special planning is and how it can be put into practice uh, with the, the goal of achieving ecosystem-based management. So it was developed from November 2007 to May 2009, so for about two years. All the steps are based on real-world MSP experiences. Um, from around the globe, and the guide was revised and refined during three expert meetings and two fine-tuning events uh, with resource managers and decision makers, one at Massachusetts and the other one at Vietnam. And so the 10 steps um, of, of this guide uh, are first establishing the need for marine special planning and authority then attaining, obtaining financial support, and this is very important. Uh, well, they all are. The third step is organizing the MSP process. This is one of the most complex uh, steps, and we will go through each uh, and one of these steps. Four, we need to engage stakeholders. Then we need to analyze existing conditions. Then we need to analyze future conditions where we would like to, to be. Then we need to actually develop the plan, evaluate its performance and monitoring, and adapting the process. And this is a, 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 an image from the step-by-step -step guide where you can see the link 
between the links between the different steps, and they are not linear. Um, there are feedback loops, and and we will go into that as well. And so, first of all, step one is identifying the need and establishing authority for marine spatial planning. And so there, are, it has two main tasks: identifying why MSP is needed why should we do this, and then establishing authority to do it. And here what we want to know is what problem do we need to address with marine special planning. This will help keep efforts focused throughout the process. So we need to ask, do we have incompatible uses or are they expected to happen? Do we have important habitats that are being affected by new or existing uses? Uh, do we need to identify multiple use areas to ensure uh, compatible uses? And one of the things that the guide starts by saying is that if you don't have any problem, neither current, neither anticipated, you might not need MSP. Uh, that is usually not the case. But most countries that have MSP in place started by tackling a specific problem or a specific conflict uh, existing or anticipated. For example, new offshore wind energy facilities for Belgium and Germany, ecosystem protection in Australia. Australia is one of the most known, known um, cases of green special planning that is based on protection and conservation of ecosystems, goods and services. And for example, conflicts between offshore phosphate mining and fishing uh, are, are leading to the development of MSP in South Africa and Namibia. And so, after identifying why we need MSP, we need to establish the, the ways to implement it, the authority to implement it. And there are two types of authority in marine special planning, the authority to plan and the authority to implement it. And so the authority to plan has to do with existing, with having legislation. And this can be done with creating new legislation, as it was the case for Australia, for example. It can also be done by using existing legislation that can be slightly adapted or reinterpreted or even amended. Or there can be also uh, an intention to incorporate MSP in legislation that is already being prepared. For example, in some cases, there are specific legislation uh, to regulate new offshore infrastructures and marine special planning can be, uh, authority can be uh, insured with such uh, legislation. This is important because uh, without legal status, enforcing and implementing MSP is very difficult. Even with legal status, sometimes it's difficult, as you will see in one of the latest steps later steps. So, and of course that each of these approaches, uh, creating new legislation, using existing legislation, or, or, or then the last one, all of them have advantages and disadvantages. And it, it will be selected on a case-by-case -case, um, approach. The other type of authority is the authority to implement marine special planning. And this has to do with the entities that will do it. Uh, it can be centralized in one organization that is specifically designed for marine special planning implementation. This is usually not the case. Uh, the most common approach is either uh, MSP being implemented by existing management authorities that are responsible for single sectors or single uh, activities, as it is the case of Norway, Belgium, and Germany, or a mixed approach uh, where some new entities are created and they work in collaboration with existing ones. The second step uh, has to do with obtaining financial support and it has again two tasks. The first one is identifying alternative financing mechanisms. So marine special planning is not possible without adequate financial resources. The guide has a, I'm not sure if, if it's the guide or the website has a, a nice sentence about um, money is not important as long as it, it's enough. So 
and this can be applied to a lot of things, and it's true. And it's also true for marine spatial planning. So in many times, uh, agencies with responsibilities on marine spatial planning do not have the budget to do it, and so alternative financing mechanisms are needed. And this can come from a lot of sources. They can include grants and donations from international organizations uh, or foundations, partnerships with non-governmental organizations, funds from the private sector, and even individual sector revenue, revenues or user fees. Yes, exactly. <laughs> one important thing is not relying on just one alternative source of, of funding. And so the second task is um, analyzing the feasibility of these alternative sources. Um, not the same, the, t the same type of alternative funding will not work everywhere, that is clear. It will change from place to place and it will, has to be, it will have to be personalized to the country or territory where MSP will be developed. Uh, and so financial, legal, administrative, social and political considerations and environmental ones must be taken into account. And here is the sentence that I thought would appear in the previous uh, slide, <laughs> that a key to success is not relying on only one source of, of funding. So the third step is a dense one, um, but it, it's also a very important one. It is about organizing the process through pre-planning pre of marine special planning. So it entails creating an, an MSP team developing a work plan, defining boundaries about space and time, no, not only spatial boundaries, but all, also time bound, boundaries, uh, defining principles, defining goals, defining smart objectives, which is very imp important because objectives need to be measured. Uh, many times, and this happened in Portugal, for example, um, objectives are mixed with goals. They should be specific, measurable, achievable. Sometimes what happens is that they are very vague and abstract, and that, that's not good for, for evaluating MSP in the end. And also identifying the risks and developing contingency plans to address those risks. So creating the marine special planning team. It is important to have a multidisciplinary team with knowledge about different areas from uh, biology to, to uh, economy, uh, climate, a lot of things. But it's also very important to have administrative skills, programmatic skills, knowledge skills when developing marine special planning. Uh, it's key that, uh, that the team uh, works properly, that conflict resolution is present, that strategic communication is ensured. So all these types of different skills uh, need to be present on the MSP team. But not all of them have to be ensured by team members, when team, because it would be probably a daunting uh, task. So when a skill is not present on the team, it has to be easily accessible by establishing collaborations, for example. Some skills can be obtained from government ag agencies or ministries, uh, scientific community, um, or non-governmental organizations through consultation processes, for example. The second task of this step is developing a work plan. This is an essential part of developing MSP. Well, most of the tasks and the, and the steps are essential, and that's why they are in the guide, but still. Um, developing a work plan will help uh, organize the efforts to really attain the marine special plan. So a work plan has to be very specific, and it has to clearly state what parts of the process will be done by whom, by what time, and at what costs, and how the different elements of the involved in, in the plan uh, relate to each other. Uh, um, a, an important uh, tool to do this is having a schedule, also defining the time to be spent on each step. 
this will help, help to keep track of the evolution of the process. And these are types of actions that can be carried to develop a work plan, uh, list the main activities needed to develop the work plan, uh, be aware of what has worked and what has not worked in MSP practice around the world, assigning responsibilities for tasks within the various members of the MSP team, and there are a lot more. So the third task is defining um, those boundaries, those spatial and temporal boundaries for marine spatial planning. And when defining boundaries, these are uh, spatial boundaries, you have the boundaries for management, implementation, and the boundaries for analysis, for planning, and these usually are not the same. So management areas in marine special planning tend to correspond to entire exclusive economic zones or the marine waters of a specific state, as it happens in the USA, or a bioregion, as it happened in uh, Canada and Australia. And another important thing is that usually management boundaries do not coincide with ecosystem boundaries. And this is very clear in the ocean because it is also clear in terrestrial ecosystems. But in the ocean, everything is very dynamic and fluid and you have uh, no, almost no physical boundaries. And so um, this difference between management and ecosystems is very evident. And so what happens is that there ends up being a, a variety of ecosystems within that management area and they change and they are influenced by external and internal processes. So all of these has to be considered uh, when uh, developing and defining the boundaries. And I just want to say I'm just giving you a bit of information on, one, on each of these tasks and each of these steps because this is a very long document and and either I would spend an entire day talking about it or I would just give you a bit of information on each task. So if you go to the document and if you go to the website, there are a lot of information on each of these topics. So this is just to give you an idea of what the guide is about, the step-by-step -step guide. At the other side, we have the boundaries for analysis. Uh, as I said, they do not coincide with management boundaries. They tend to be, or they should be, broader than the management boundaries so that they could identify uh, sources of influence, for example, pollution, uh, that can affect the management area. And also to try to include such authorities and institutions that are responsible for those sources of uh, influence in the implementation of the plan. This happened in Rhode Island. Um, one of the states in the United States that has MSP in place for a long time. And what they did was that the management area of the, the Rhode Island state would only go into, the th into three nautical miles. And so that was the management boundary. But they extended that to 20 nautical miles when they, they defined the analysis boundary. So they analyzed 20 nautical miles even though they only had um, authority to plan for three. And that was good. That, that's what, a good example of how these two um, boundaries can work. Another thing is defining the time frame for marine spatial planning. And this is basically about defining the base year that will give you a, a time boundary for defining current and existing conditions. And this is something that will be done in step five of the guide. And also a target year that defines the period that you are planning for. And this will allow you to identify the future conditions that will appear, that will be addressed in step six. Often, um, however, these time boundaries have also to coincide and to be adapted to be aligned with other national planning periods that vary from context to context. So the fourth task of step three is about defining principles. And what is a principle? It's basically a quality that determines the nature and characteristics of your MSP process. And it should be aligned 
of what you expect uh, to be the outcomes and the results of the process. Examples of common principles used in marine spatial planning are these, the ecosystem integrity principle, where you say that there should be a primary focus on maintaining ecosystem structure and, and services. And this is uh, one of the things that it's very clear in marine spatial planning processes that are based on conservation and that start by, um, by, the, by management plans for marine protected areas. Uh, another one is the integration pr principle, the public trust principle. The transparency principle, information has to be clear and available for all people involved. And the precautionary principle and also the polluter base principle. Of course, there are many more, um, but these are some common ones. In the Portuguese case, there was a, a funny uh, <laughs> example where uh, economic exploitation was a principle and there was a lot of discussion about uh, if, sh if it should be a principle or not uh, or an objective or a goal and but so this is just to say that it can vary from from among contexts and among countries the next step after defining principles is defining goals and so a goal is a statement of general direction or intention that you hope that it will be achieved and so it's a bit more specific than a principle. These are examples of goals that can be set uh, for MSP, conserve and protect marine resources or ensure sustainability of economic uses of marine space or ensure that the contribution of blue growth to the country is larger. You can choose among many different options. And this is a place where we can compare goals with objectives and uh, as I said a, a very important aspect because it will influence how the whole process will be uh, monitored and evaluated uh, in the end. So goals tend to be broader, objectives narrower. Uh, goals are general intentions, objectives are supposed to be precise Goals are not tangible and objectives are. Goals are abstract, objectives should be concrete. Goals cannot be measured and objectives should be uh, measured. I'm saying should be because many times they are not. And so defining smart objectives, what is this smart objectives? Uh, an objective is a statement of desired outcomes or observable behavioral changes that represent the achievement of a goal. And so SMART objectives are the ones that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound. These are considered to be good objectives. And, the, and this is uh, how you can see if a, an objective is SMART or not. How do you see if it's specific? Is the objective concrete, detailed, focused and well defined? Does the objective define an outcome? This is a way of seeing if it is specific. About being measurable, can the objective be expressed as a quantity? That's a, a very good way of measuring it. Uh, you have an example here where this objective clearly states that you want to achieve 20% of the, of the overall energy demand in the marine region by 2020. So it has a date. It has a specific target, a measurable target, 20%. It has to be achievable. Uh, can we get it done? Do we have or can we get the resources to attain this objective? Uh, so it has to be, there has to be reality, a reality perspective when you do this. Uh, and also, is it relevant? Will this objective lead to a desired goal? Will it put the goal in practice? Uh, does the sufficient knowledge, authority and capability exist to do that? And also time bound, when will we accomplish the objective? This is very important. Is a finish and start date clearly defined? And as I said before, smart objectives play a critical role in evaluating MSP performance, which will be step six. So, all these tasks and all these steps are really interconnected as you can as you can see or get a glimpse of. 
And so these were the two examples of smart objectives. They were time-bound, they were measurable, they were specific, um, and supposedly achievable. And the last task of the organizing the process is identifying risks and developing contingency planning, contingency plans. Uh, so we want to prepare for what can go wrong during this planning process. This is very important. Um, we, so, and, and to that, uh, we should define and we should identify what can delay or compromise the key steps and tasks of the process. Uh, and what contingency measures could we, could we develop to address uh, these, these risks? And we reach now step four, <laughs> organizing stakeholder participation. I will again say that this is very important, and it is. It has three main tasks, defining who should be engaged, defining when to engage stakeholders, and defining how to engage them. So when defining who should be engaged, um, first you must to identify, to know and define what stakeholders are. They are all the individuals, groups, and organizations that are affected, involved, or interested in marine spatial planning. But not all stakeholders will be affected the same way. And for that reason, not all stakeholders are as important. <coughs> and so, although, uh, well, for one side, stakeholders' involvement, involvement is key to ensure that marine spatial planning reflects all the expectations, conflicts, opportunities that take place in a management area. Many times, stakeholders are not properly engaged, and this is a real problem because then plans are not enforced, are not complied to, and if stakeholders are involved from the beginning, some issues might never appear and can be avoided. At the same time, it is important to in involve all the relevant stakeholders. Too many stakeholders or stakeholders at the wrong time of the process can be negative. So what we can do to, to ensure that the priority stakeholders are involved is to conduct a stakeholder analysis. Uh, still, in many cases, uh, priority stakeholders are the ones that will be directly affected by MSP decisions the ones that are dependent on the resources that are being managed on the area, the ones that have legal claims or obligations over that area, or, for example, uh, NGOs and cultural advocacy groups that have a special interest in the area that will be managed in, uh, with the MSP process. The second question is, when should, sta should stakeholders be uh, engaged? And ideally, this would happen throughout the process uh, and should be accomplished early, often, and in a sustained manner. And as you can see um, in, the, in the image, this symbol, this triangle, means that these steps, whoop, sorry that all these steps should include uh, stakeholder involvement. So most of the steps through the developing and analysis of the planning and also the adaptation of the planning, the monitoring and evaluation and the implementation. So basically most process, most steps and most tasks should include uh, stakeholder involvement. And there are many ways to involve stakeholders many types of stakeholder participation. And this can go from uh, negotiation, where information is really on the table <coughs> and decisions are shared, to simple communication of results or consultation through formal consultation processes that many times don't lead anywhere. And so depending on the approach that is followed, uh, some or even more than one of, of these types of stakeholder participation can be uh, selected. And they can also be selected um, at different points of the, the development of the plan. You can start maybe with just information and communication at a, an initial stage, and then when the plan is being developed and management decisions are being taken, uh, consultation and negotiation 
may be uh, present. So the same process can have different types of stakeholder participation. And it's very important to keep the participation effective. And so we reach step five, which is about defining and analyzing existing conditions. And this step will try to answer this question, that is, where are we now? And this is very important because the next step will be where we want to be. So where are we now? To answer this, there are three tasks. Mapping information on ecological, environmental, and oceanographic conditions. Collecting and mapping information about human activities and identifying conflicts and capabilities. In reality, task one and two will provide information to develop task three. An important aspect is that collecting and compiling spatial explicit data is often the most time-consuming aspect of planning and management activities. And you have discussed data and management information throughout the week, so uh, you know this is this is a very challenging uh, task. Um, the best, when, when you're developing marine spatial planning, uh, usually the areas that are being managed are large, and the best data is the one that covers most of the marine management area. So fine scale data is many times not the best option because you will have it for a certain place, but you will not have it for the entire management area, and you need to make decisions for the entire management area. Um, also, data can be collected from different sources, including scientific literature and uh, experts, experts' opinion or advice, government sources, local knowledge, and direct field measurement. measurement. Usually, the three initial ones, scientific literature, experts' opinion, and government sources, are the ones that are most used. In some places, not to say all, local knowledge, however, is very important because it will provide insights about people that really know the place and that are not available anywhere else. So the first task is mapping information on ecological, environmental and oceanographic conditions. And this is central to marine spatial planning. You need to know which areas are most important to preserve and which are comp compatible with development. Uh, if someone appears and says, I want to conserve everything, no one will listen. And sometimes that is why conservation ends up being out the table in marine spatial planning conversations. So the identification and mapping of ecologically or biological significant areas, uh, EPSAs, that is areas that are more, more valuable when compared to surrounding ones, is very important. And these are types of ecological and significant areas, areas of high biodiversity, areas of high endemism, areas of high productivity, such as upwelling areas, for example, aggregation sites, well, where uh, populations uh, tend to be concentrated, spawning or breeding areas, calving areas, feeding and foraging areas, nesting, nursery areas, migration stopovers, uh, wetlands, seagrass beds, coral reefs, many times the, these last three correspond to other ones, to the previous ones. And so after having information on the ecosystem goods and services that are present, you should also have information on human activities that are taking place and that will take place, or that are intended to also be in place. And so this is also key for marine spatial planning, identifying the spatial and temporal distribution and density of important human activities in the marine management area. There are a lot of, area of uh, activities that are used and that are mapped. Fishing is one of them, aquaculture, um, Fishing can be either commercial or recreational, marine transportation, um, offshore uh, renewable energies, well, cables and pipelines, areas for scientific research, cultural and, and heritage, cultural heritage areas, uh, and also, of course, marine parks and nature conservation areas. And this is different from mapping ecosystem services and goods. 
uh, many times there are some um, confusions about the two, but they are not the same. One thing is to map the entire uh, services or part that are in the management area, the ecosystem services. Another thing is to identify protected areas. And many times in many processes, what happens is that only the protected areas are mapped. The first part are not really um, included, which will lead to a lot of different problems in the future. No, the protected areas are many times included in the management area. So the management area is the area where you will develop, well, where you will develop the marine special plan. Is basically the area selected to develop the marine special plan, and that can include protected areas or not. Um, and so it, it's one layer of information uh, on top of that planning area. A different thing is getting knowledge and mapping the ecosystem services that are present in that, in that planning area. So the management area is where you want to develop the marine special plan. It can include different types of uses, including protected areas. One thing that is not uh, here, but it's very important, is that uh, one of the, there are some major challenges in marine special planning. And when one of the, the challenges that has been identified in the last decade is the lack of uh, social information and the human dimension, data for, the, for those two in marine spatial planning processes. Usually what happens is that as, marine, as ecosystem services end up only be including true <laughs> conservation areas, uh, human uses end up only be including true areas where human uses take place. But in, in, rather, and that rather than only using that, the human dimension, the links between people, the complexity of relationships, the relationship with local communities, the, their dependency on the sea, all of that information should be included, should be uh, adopted by the process, and usually is not. So after having information on the ecological part and on the socio-economic part, you should be able to identify current conflicts and compatibilities. compatibilities. So you need to search for spatial overlaps, either conflicts or compatibilities, because while some uses cannot occur in the same place, others can. For, for example, like uh, aquaculture and renewable energy, there has been discussions of, of having both in the same place. Uh, but, for example, you cannot have uh, pipelines and fisheries in the same place if the fisheries are <coughs> getting to the bottom. So you need to identify those spatial overlaps and if, if uh, those areas have conflicts or compatibilities. Uh, not only among human activities, but also between uh, uses and the environment. And ultimately, if there are no overlaps, you may not need marine spatial planning, but this is very rarely, rarely the, the case. This is a matrix uh, that appears in the step-by-step -step guide that shows uh, comp compatibilities and conflicts between different uses. You can see that some the the darker ones are the ones that are compatible. The green are incompatible uses, and these one are probably compatible. So there's they need more information. This type of data should be taken into account when making decisions. Another thing that can take place at this stage is the assessment of cumulative impacts uh, so that areas that are more pressured uh, are identified. And then we get to step six. Uh, so we already, supposedly and hopefully, we already answer the question about where we are and now we have to define where we want to be. And we have four main text, tasks. Projecting current, projecting current trends in the spatial and temporal needs of existing uses, estimating the needs for new demands of ocean use, 
identifying alternative futures and selecting one of those futures, uh, one of those scenarios. So marine spatial planning is indeed a future-oriented activity. Planning should reveal possible alternative futures on how the management area could look like in 10, 15, or 20 years. And to do that, uh, projections and forecasts are used and can help visualize what is likely to happen. Um, and what should be done is there should be a, a projection for each of the human uses um, for that area so that you can visualize the conflicts and compatibilities about <coughs> that uses, uh, the, the pro the, their projected evolution, and then decide. And this is a place where climate change can be incorporated in marine spatial planning. And many times it is not. Many times, usually, it's not considered. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's another major challenge of marine spatial planning, and it will definitely impact ecosystems, which in turn will lead to changes in the, in the distribution of the uses that rely on those ecosystems, and marine spatial planning will need to be able to incorporate the challenge and adapt to it, uh, because if it, it will not be able to, project, to, to predict everything. Um, so this is a major challenge, and it's a place where it, it can be incorporated into the process. So besides uh, projecting existing uses, we should also analyze new uses and new demands for ocean space. Uh, these usually are related to the development of new technologies, usually related to offshore renewable energy, and sometimes offshore aquaculture. <coughs> And requirements for such new demands must be integrated when mapping future scenarios in the previous task. And this might reveal, in some cases, that the total demand for ocean space is larger than it was actually available. Um, and some uses cannot simply uh, continue without conflicting with other uses or with the environment. Um, I think that this was done for, I think it was for Belgium, in 2005, and it showed that the demand, the demand for space was like three times uh, larger than the actual space that was available. So it's very important to have this information it, and to build on it, to have a clear and real view of what can happen and plan for it. And so the third task is about identifying possible alternative futures for the planning area. Uh, there will there will always be a variety of alternatives, um, and human uses will be distributed differently according to the importance that you give to certain goals and objectives. So a scenario will be different, and the, 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 um, the distribution of uses will be different if you are giving prior, priority to biodiversity conservation, or to economic development, or to society and culture. Um, in the case of Belgium, at some point, six alternative spatial scenarios were, were developed based on different objectives, and then one was selected. And this is exactly uh, task four, selecting, selecting the preferred spatial scenario, one of the previous ones. Ideally, the alternative that will produce results in the most effective, efficient, and equitable way. And it's important that we really look into the feasibility of the scenario. Some scenarios can be too costly to implement. Others can be too difficult to enforce. And so all these has to be considered. And the selected scenario will form the basis for implementation and for selecting management actions. And, and this is some of the criteria that can be used to select a, a spatial CU scenario. Exactly, the feasibility of financing, political considerations, timing considerations, uh, and obviously economic effects and, and biophysical uh, and ecological effects. And so we already know where we are. We already know where we want to be. And so we are now going to prepare and approve our spatial management plan. Uh, and the question is, how do we get there? We have, again, five more tasks. 
The first one is identifying alternative management actions, incentives, and institutional arrangements. Then we'll need to specify criteria for selecting marine special management actions, developing a zoning plan. This is very important. Uh, and there are major discussions about if zoning is the same as marine special planning. For some people, it is the same. For other people, it's just a, to, uh, a tool to ensure marine special planning, and that's the vision that is uh, included in the, the UNESCO guide. Then we need to evaluate the management plan and approve the management plan. And I know you're getting tired of this, but we are already in step seven and there are only ten. So, so the first task, identifying alternative management actions, incentives, and arrangements, institutional arrangements. So management actions are a means of delivering uh, the goods and services from a marine management area. So they're basically a way to make uh, objectives operational, to do things. Almost, in almost case, they are directed towards single sectors, and they need to specify how, where, and when human activities should occur. And these are an example of management actions for fisheries. So management actions for fisheries can be about uh, fishery closure areas, including seasonal closures, no troll areas, critical habitat designations, artificial reef areas, vulnerable marine ecosystem designations by FAO. And so you have a lot of these types of information uh, of management actions in the guide for each of the, of the sectors, fishing, aquaculture, renewable energy, and so on. And this was just an example. About incentives, they are positive and negative means to induce action, to implement <coughs> the management actions. Uh, they can be economic, for example, fees, but they can also be non-economic, uh, related to uh, information, uh, education, and even the, the, the implementation of regulation. Sorry. And indeed, incentives are needed to implement management areas uh, actions to then achieve the desired results. And the last type of uh, the last action of this task is defining the institutional arrangements. Uh, basically define what institutions will have the authority to apply the incentives and to implement management actions. So uh, it's important to, to define uh, the responsibility for relevant tasks of marine special planning uh, to different public agencies and in some cases between public agencies and private entities. Usually what's happening, what, what happens is that multiple management agencies are usually involved and it's, it's crucial uh, so that they can work together to define what institutions do which tasks and how institutions are integrated and relate to each other. So the second task is specifying criteria for selecting marine special management actions. And after identifying alternatives for management actions, they must be evaluated and selected, as we've done before with scenarios. And we need criteria to do that. And we not only need criteria, but we need to define which criteria is most important, so weights for the criteria. And this will, can be changed uh, with stakeholder consultation. So you can set, the team can set a number of criteria and they are very convinced that the first one is more important than the third. And then what happens is that stakeholders get involved and say, no, this is not like this. Our reviews are that the second is the most important and things change. And that, that's very important. Um, that's one of the reasons why stakeholders' engagement and involvement is very important. And this is, you cannot see it very well, but these are criteria for selecting uh, management actions uh, that are also in the guide. And so the third task is developing the zoning plan. And the zoning plan is a means uh, uh, through which the purpose of each part of the area can be used. Uh, there are very ty various types of zoning plans. Some of them are much more complex than others. 
They are indeed a key element of marine spatial planning, but not the same as MSP. This is the view that it's uh, enshrined in the guide. But they are a key element. The final zoning product, the final zoning plan, will be the result of a lot of compromise, a lot of accommodating, a range of needs, interests, and political requirements. So it will not be a simple task because some people think that if it's, this is just a tool, it's something simple, but it's not. Uh, it's a way to visualize all the decisions that were made before. And to add to such complexity, in some cases, um, people are trying to include the third dimension, so to make not only uh, uh, zoning on the surface, but having vertical zoning, the water column, into MSP, and even temporal zoning um, as the fourth dimension. So this complicates more what, what's already complicated. And so, after developing, developing the zoning plan, we'll need to evaluate the plan. And this is the place where many countries carry strategic environmental assessments, such as uh, in the Europe region, or programmatic environmental impact statements, in, such as in the USA. Um, and it's, uh, it's very important to, to take a look. Uh, usually this is not done by the same people uh, who develop the entire plan. So it gives an external look into something that, that has been already developed for quite time now, for quite a time. Uh, it's also a place where you can perform the assessment of cumulative uh, effects if you haven't done it before. And, and, and it's an it's, um, it's, uh, opportunity to look into the planet and to identify problems that were not seen before. And so after uh, evaluating and everything, we need to approve the plan. And this can take many time. <laughs> it can take years. Um, in Portugal, the second attempt to have a marine special plan, because the first uh, did not uh, go through, um, started three years ago. And the plan is almost ready for a year and a half. And it's still not uh, approved. And they are always saying that it will be in the next quarter. And now it's supposed to be in the first quarter of 2019. But you never know. And then this is a place where political, um, where the political dimension uh, has a lot of influence. And sometimes plans that are developed for many years end up not being approved and implemented. And so, but basically this is the formal adoption process of the plan that was developed before. And it can include approving any new changes in management boundaries if needed, establishing any new institutional arrangements needed, approving any new staffing or organi organizational changes if necessary, and approving the allocation of new funds to implement, monitor, and evaluate the plan if proposed. And so, the first round of planning should be completed by now, and uh, MSP program is formally approved and established, and now we can go to one of the three last steps of marine spatial planning development, which is the implementation and the enforcing of the plan. So this has three tasks. The first two is to implement the, the plan, and the other two are ensuring compliance and enforcing. So the first task um, is about converting marine special plans into actual operating programs. It is, it is the action phase. And responsible, responsible entities will begin, to, will begin to implement the management actions that were selected before. And, of course, effective implementation is also key to the success of any marine special planning program because you can have a plan approved, but if it's not implemented, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. It was not worth all the work that was developed. After implementing the plan, after implementing the management actions, it's important to ensure, or while implementing the actions, ensure compliance with the plan, with the actions. 
So is the conformance to the requirements of the specific management actions by relevant ocean users. So it is important that ocean, user, ocean users act in accordance to such management actions. Um, if they do not, the plan will not work. Um, and it's important to take into account that if requirements of management actions are poorly designed, achieving compliance will be difficult. And this is why many times compliance and enforcement are key but often weak links in marine special planning. Enforcement refers to the set of actions that government actually take to achieve compliance. And MSP will only be as effective as its ability to enforce approved plans, as well as rules and regulations. And enforcement can be carried by government. And this usually includes inspections and negotiations and legal action. But it can also be carried by non-governmental organizations and certain ocean uses, such as banking and insurance, for example. And so here we reach the, the step nine, monitoring and evaluating performance. And as you know, okay, there is an entire guide only about this. It was published in 2014, and actually it is here. <laughs> it's keeping the, <laughs> the computer on the spot. And um, so there's an entire guide only with this information. So you need to be aware of that. We will only brief, very briefly address this. And so there are two, three tasks, three main tasks in monitoring and evaluating performance of a plan. Developing a performance plan, performance monitoring and evaluation plan. Evaluate performance using monitoring data and reporting results. The first task um, is key to adaptive management which will be in the next step. If we don't measure results, how can we tell if, if we are going uh, in the right direction or if we are failing? We have to measure results. And so, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the results that we get, the measuring, measurements that we make, need to be used to modify revisions in future plans, because if we don't do that, we are not being successful. Uh, so, selection of relevant and measurable indicators is one of the most important component, components of performance monitoring and evaluation. We have to have the right indicators so that we can actually assess results properly and then use the results to uh, revise our plan. And these are key actions of performance monitoring and evaluation. Reconfirming marine special planning objectives, agreeing on the outcomes, to measure, identify the set of key performance indicators to monitor, and these are usually divided into governance indicators, socioeconomic indicators, and environmental indicators, and establishing baseline data to be used with such indicators and define where we are according to, to that step. And so we then have to evaluate uh, the performance using the data. And evaluation is the element of management uh, in which the greatest learning occurs. It's a way to allow information from the past to feed back into the process and improve the way we manage the future. So evaluation consists of reviewing our results uh, and assessing whether these, re these actions that were taken have produced the re desired results or not. Uh, and ideally, evaluation should be undertaken periodically during the entire lifetime of the marine spatial planning process. This is also the time when we should decide and, and have the courage to remove actions that were not working and invest in actions that do work. And last, we have to report results. And this is important. Um, it, it's important to have a, a good communication strategy to do that. Um, it's essential um, to share that information with key, state, with key stakeholders and that can, can generate trust and support in the process, which is very important. 
and performance data should be reported in comparison to the baseline data that we had. So finally, we get to the last step, and that is adapting the process. And adaptive management, it's a systematic approach for improving management through learning by monitoring, commonly known as learning by doing. And, and it's, neither, it's needed if MSP wants to be sustained and sustainable over time. So it basically, it's about planning, doing, evaluating, and learning, and analyzing and revising. Um, however, adaptive management is rarely implemented. This is a problem. This is always a problem. Things look like uh, look very well in conceptually, but then putting things into practice is usually very difficult. And that's also the case with adaptive management. Uh, some people believe that this is also related with the fact that not many uh, countries already have revised marine special plans. So there are not many uh, common practices on that yet. So everyone is hoping that in the future uh, this problem will be, uh, will be solved. And so there are three main tasks. Propose changes in objectives and management actions. Identify new information that can be relevant to the new rounds of planning. And start the new rounds of planning. And so proposing changes in objectives should be done by addressing two main questions. What has been accomplished to the marine spatial planning process and learn from its successes and failures? And how has the context changed since the program was initiated? Uh, we are talking not only about environmental change, such as climate change, but also governance change, technolo technology change, and socioeconomic change. The answers to these questions uh, can be used to refocus the new round of planning. This is very important. And so, as marine spatial planning is developed, research, uh, applied research also evolves, and new information get, come continuously, is continuously produced and av in getting available. And at the same time, it's important to report on the problems, the setbacks and failures, and the things that went well in the management of that area to to establish needs for new research that is needed to develop a research agenda. And finally, the start, the, the next round of planning is doing this all over again. And the, doing this all over again and all over again and all over again. This is what uh, good marine special planning should look like. It's, it's never about getting to a result. It's about a process, a continuous process. And in a nutshell, <laughs> This is what the guidelines uh, about marine special planning are all about. And so the second part is about the directive, but this will be very short, I promise. Um, this, this is just a sneak peek into the directive uh, that was published in 2014, the Marita Maritime Special Planning Directive. And so in July 2014, the European Parliament and the Council of the European Union adopted uh, legislation, a directive, establishing a framework for marine spatial planning. And the goal was to create a common framework for developing MSP uh, in member states of the European Union um, with the goal of promoting sustainability, sustainable growth of maritime, of maritime economies, sustainable development of marine areas, and sustainable use of resources. And uh, landlocked uh, member states are excluded. Uh, they are not obliged to this directive, uh, evidently. And so 23 countries are included, and we will see them. And Two months later, uh, the directive entry into force. This is common procedure. And so while each member state still has the freedom to plan its own maritime, its own maritime activities, um, at the same time, the directive uh, provides uh, um, a, a common framework so that local, regional, and national planning will become more comfortable with a set of minimum requests that we will see that are specified, and this is very imp important when we have shared seas. And of course, that again, uh, the ocean does not have boundaries, so ultimately all the ocean is shared. But in Europe, 
there are specific areas that are shared among countries, the Mediterranean Sea, North Sea, the Baltic Sea, and so it's important to have a common view uh, on, on, on what's being developed and, and where do we want to go. Um, okay. And so by, this was published in 2014 and two years later all countries had to transpose uh, the directive into their national legislation and this could happen by creating new, new legislation as we've seen before when establishing authority for MSP or by adapting um, existing legislation. In the Portuguese case, for example, we created a new uh, law and new regulations for marine spatial planning. And then countries also had to appoint competent authorities. Um, by September 2016, many countries did not uh, comply with the deadline, but afterwards they transposed the directive. And at this stage, most, country, most countries all ha have already done it. And now marine spatial plans need to be in place, implemented in national waters of these uh, member states until the end of March 2021. So these are the countries that are obliged to comply with the directive. Uh, the ones in the, in the left are the ones that already have approved or implemented, implemented marine spatial plans for the, their national space. And the ones on the right are the ones that have marine spatial planning under development. And this includes very different stages in development, but they are all, all of them are, are doing it. And this was in the, the beginning of the year. So if you want specific information on any of these countries, the European MSP platform has a complete um, sheets for each country with detailed information about the legislations in place and available, the, the authorities that are being responsible for the process, uh, and all the information about plans and characterizations that are available are here. And sorry. <laughs> And it, it's also established that marine spatial plans for these countries must be reviewed every 10 years. And so the first revision will be, um, will be due in 2031, we hope. Let's see. And these are the key minimum requirements that the directive establishes uh, that should be applied uh, in every country and that should be transposed to to all, uh, to the national legislation of all member states, all, all these three, 23 member states. And these requirements are about involving stakeholders, as we've seen, developing cross-border cooperation um, because of the shared uh, seas, applying an ecosystem-based approach, that is an approach that looks at the ecosystem as an entire one and that has the specificity of including humans in the ecosystem. So humans are seen as part of the ecosystem, not as an external factor. Uh, countries are, are obliged to use the, or are compelled to use the best available data and share information. And there are a lot of, of pro, pro projects ongoing, uh, funded by the EU uh, with this purpose. Take into account land sea integration in, in, and interaction, promote the coexistence of activities, and be reviewed every 10 years at least. The directive also identifies some um, activities that must be included in marine spatial planning, but member states can add additional <coughs> sectors. And these are aquaculture, fisheries, shipping, nature conservation, tourism, uh, oil and gas, renewable energy, and so on. And in this document, this is a, a very short document that was published in 2015, uh, gives you a quick uh, look about uh, the, the Maritime Special Planning Directive. And here they highlight uh, these four topics, aquaculture and fishing, uh, in fisheries in the EU, the importance of marine maritime transport, of uh, environmental protection and of tourism. And finally, and how we'll end, uh, very recently there was this announcement 
in the in the UNESCO webpage um, about a new uh, initiative, a joint initiative by the UNESCO and the European Commission to launch um, something called MSP Global. And what they will do, they will use two regional pilot projects, one in the West Mediterranean and another one in the Southeast Pacific, uh, to study and to examine how cross-border maritime spatial planning can take place. And this will start in January 2019 and will carry for three years. And so thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> and this just gives you a, a quick look about these two documents and you can find a bunch of information online and in the documents themselves, especially the, the guide, the step-by-step -step guide, because it's huge. It's enorm enormous and has many detailed information that it's important and that you can take a look if you need it. Thank you. <laughs>